Welcome to Coffee, Culture, and the Capital with Sophia and Greg. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. We have um, two interesting bills to talk to you all about today. One of them, SB 729. This bill we actually saw happen last year, and now it's being brought back to life this year. Correct, Greg? It came alive from the dead. Yes, and this is one of those bills that when we talk about it right now, you're going to think, there's no way. That's, no one would do that. So if you don't trust us, go look it up yourself, SB 729. But this bill ultimately says it redefines infertility to any person that cannot get pregnant on their own. Greg, can any person get pregnant as a single person on their own with no medical intervention? Uh, not that I know of. Uh, the human species uh, comes in two parts. There's a male and a female, and we are created that way by God. And it's a glorious thing when families start and a male and female gets together and starts a family. But mm -hmm. California doesn't quite think that's fair that single people don't get to have babies or same-sex couples don't get to have babies. That's discrimination. And who are they complaining to? Well, I don't know. Who, who created us? Who, who, who discriminated? Mm, God, I guess. That uh, wasn't in God's design that single people could have children. And California, now that technology has advanced to allow single people with the help of technology to have a child, they are going to mandate that insurance companies cover it. And so I'm just putting together a story. It's going to be published a little later today. And I'm just going to read you a little paragraph here. It says, SB 729 seeks to broaden the definition of infertility beyond its traditional medical scope. Historically, infertility has been defined as the inability to conceive after one year of unprotected intercourse due to a medical condition. So it's a disorder. It's like something's not going right. That's infertility. However, under SB 2729, infertility would be redefined to include individuals who are unable to conceive due to their sexual orientation or gender identity. Which, which means either they don't have a partner. If, you don't, if you're a single person don't have a partner, California says you're infertile. Something's wrong with you. Or if you are a same-sex couple, two women or two men, and obviously two men can't have a baby and they can't conceive and neither can two women. But you will be considered infertile even though your bodies are perfectly normal, operating perfectly you are going to be considered infertile in order for us to ma mandate that an insurance company cover um, in vert uh, vitro fertilization, IVF, or surrogacy. Surrogacy is hiring a woman to have your child for you. Like that's what a same-sex couple uh, who's male, um, obviously they need a female to grow a baby and give them a child. So they would hire, and I'm not sure if folks, if we've been paying attention, I, I certainly have not, to California, I'm discovering, is a surrogacy hotspot for not only country, but the world. People come here to rent women's bodies in order to have children implanted in them, uh, and so they can get kids. And I know we have a, a couple websites that are set up that I think we're going to show just to show what's been happening here. Yeah. So yeah. Well, it's the, and to lead up to this website, we're going to show, um, I just want to note this bill when it's redefining infertility, it's not even just saying, Oh, two women together and two men together, um, are infertile, which duh. Um, it's saying a singular man by himself is infertile if he can't get pregnant without medical intervention. First of all, like that's just so 
let's just think about all the couples, all the married couples that actually struggle with infertility for years. And now we're just going to disregard that there is already a medical definition for infertility out there. We're going to disregard that there's a certain way for things to happen and basically say, oh, if you're a single individual and you're not having sex, you're infertile if you can't get pregnant. Like, it makes no sense what what do we get from crazy things like that. We get websites such as men having babies. So, Greg, what is this men having babies website? Well, it's it's obvious. I mean, it's kind of self-explanatory. It's men uh, who are in relationships with other men who want to have children. They want to start a family of their own. And obviously, that's kind of hard for them to do. And so there's this whole website dedicated towards helping them find a surrogate uh, and what the legal process is and what the medical process is. They had a conference coming up uh, next year in San Francisco. This conference has been happening for the last 10 years. So this has been going on a long time. Uh, and it's kind of like, well, California has allowed this to happen, but now it's going to, the, the laws are going to mandate that we normalize this and that we all with through our insurance rates pay for it. So, just like uh, a couple who has a uh, hard time conceiving, uh, now we're going to treat them the same way we do men who have a hard time conceiving or two women who have a hard time conceiving. They're going to be treated as equal. This is about equality. That's what the bill is promoted as. It's not fair that queer couples or gay couples, same-sex couples, have a harder time having children or that insurance companies don't treat them like same uh, opposite sex couples. That's discriminatory. I mean, we've heard this language for a long time. That, I mean, we got we redefined marriage because it wasn't fair that marriage only meant the recognizing a man and a woman uh, in, as a marriage. And so we changed it so that two same sex couples uh, could get married. I mean, that was all about equality and fairness. Well, this is the same thing, the same arguments. They are following the logic. Which is so, ridiculous because you can't just say, oh, this is unfair that only a man and a woman together could get pregnant because that just it followed the science. Like it's the biological truth. It's right. science. It's factual. I mean, I can sit here and be like, I wish I was five, six. It's not fair that I'm not taller, but it's like, that's just how I was made. And so I can't just go out and rewrite things or I can't like be like, we need to change the entire measurement system to show that I'm five, six instead of five, three. Like that's how ridiculous this is, what they're trying to do. And so Greg, you mentioned with this whole, and you can check out the website yourself too, menhavingbabies.org. Um, go have a filled day with it. It is beyond ridiculous what's on there. But Greg, you mentioned the way they say, oh, these men have babies is through surrogacy. And so there's this other website, um, the California Surrogacy Center. And on the picture, you can see it says, we make miracles happen every day by helping individuals and couples find alternative methods of having children that are right for them. Whether you're an intended parent hoping to start a family or are interested in becoming a surrogate mother or learning how to become an egg donor, we are committed to making your experience positive and rewarding from pre-screening to delivery and beyond. And I just want to make it clear because I don't think CFC, this is something we haven't talked about a ton because it hasn't hit um, at the legislature yet. And now that it is, we're talking about it more. CFC stands against surrogacy and IVF. We actually put out a whole statement on IVF. You can visit californiafamily.org backslash IVF um, that we stand against these um, ways to procreate. And the thing with surrogacy, I think that a lot of people don't realize they're like, oh, well, it's just a woman helping her two gay friends or it's a woman helping just an infertile male and female married couple um and there's so much that more that goes into it and so when i read from the paragraph where it says if you're interested in becoming a surrogate mother or learning how to become an egg donor what they do with surrogacy nowadays it's never just like oh they take 
if it's like let's say it's two males like a male married couple and they're like we're ready to have we want to have a child so we're gonna use surrogacy they don't find one lady and use her as a surrogate and the egg donor and then use one of their sperms they use one of their sperms and then they have a one lady as an egg donor and one lady as a surrogate mother so they want to separate the two because they want the child the baby to have as limited amount of connection to its mother so if they're then they've come upon those issues of oh they're a surrogate but it's their egg and they were surrogate throughout the pregnancy and there can be issues so they literally have to separate it to try to dehumanize this whole process um and if you go on twitter and things like that there's videos of like these it's so horrible to watch the babies are just born crying and crying and being ripped away for the only voice and person they've known for the past nine months taken away from the surrogate mother and given to two guys that are laying in the hospital bed as if they just gave birth i mean it's so dehumanizing it's so it, the facts and stats are out there about how horrible this is for children Yet, Greg, the California legislature wants to make this as easy as possible to get and get costs covered and all that, huh? They do. Um, and the cost has always been the issue. Uh, IVF is very expensive. Um, it, and this, the, uh, the insurance usually doesn't cover it because it could be up to $30,000. Um, and a lot of, and, you know, it's not guaranteed to work. Uh, and the older you get, the less guaranteed it is to work. So it's a very expensive uh, process. Um, and you think about all the ethical issues, all these little people who are created and then frozen and then left in a refrigerator or discarded or uh, used for experimentation. These are human beings. I mean, if we believe that uh, life begins at conception, then we need to be consistent in, in believing that. And that means when these little children are created in a Petri dish and they start to grow, those are human beings that God values. We are beginning to treat human life as a product to be bought and sold to folks who've got money uh, to pay for this. But now it's all going to be paid for by insurance companies. And, you know, we all have insurance and we share the costs, right? And so that's why you have the, the uh, Chamber of Commerce against this, not because of moral reasons, but because the cost is going to be so high. Uh, all these companies, how in the world are they going to help pay for their health care of their employees? Um, and so if you want to see more about uh, California Family Council's uh, concerns about I IVF, uh, go to our website, uh, somebody tap uh, californiafamily.org slash IVF. Uh, we have a, a statement there explaining our, our deep concerns about this. But, you know, we are we are really blowing up the, the biblical family with a bill like this. No longer are families about cr uh, creating families with a mother and a father that that's an essential thing that every kid needs. We are just saying, no, that's not necessary. This is about adult fulfillment. And if, a, if an adult wants a child, they have a right to have one. Even though they're creating single motherhood and uh, single fatherhood, and you're, you're more or less, the kid grows up thinking, who's my mom? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I don't have a mom or I don't have a dad, right? You're completely disconnecting them from their biological parents. That rips part of their soul away. I mean, every kid wants to know their mom and dad, even when they're adopted. You know, lots of folks want to find their real mom and dad. What are they, what are they going to do when they realize they were created in a Petri dish, right? Um, we are playing God here, and we think we can do this with no effect on society. Kids will be fine. They're resilient, you know. It's uh, it's becoming something like out of a sci-fi movie. Absolutely. And so if you're watching live on Facebook right now, if you look in the comments, we went ahead and put the link to our statement on IVF in the comments. If you are watching later on YouTube or listening on a podcast platform, 
Again, it's just californiafamily.org backslash IVF. You'll get our whole statement there. Um, we've had quite a few people sign on to the statement, such as Katie Faust with Them Before Us, Tanner DiBella with the American Council, um, John Girardi with Right to Life of Central California, and plenty of other people. So, um, yeah, go check that out. It's all about responding ethically to IVF. And then before we move on, I was I want to let you know that the, the bill right now, SB 729, is on the uh, the floor of the assembly. So all the assembly members are going to have to vote for it, and then it's going to go have to back to the Senate. So every legislator up here is going to make a decision on this bill by the end of next week. So uh, we will have a calling campaign uh, ready by the end of the day, uh, so you can reach out to your legislators. But th- you got we need to light up our legislators on this particular bill. Um, we do not want to be uh, normalizing uh, parent uh, orphans. Really, you're, you're, what you're doing, you're stripping them from their, their biological parents and then you're giving them single, uh, uh, single, single parents or you're, you're stripping a mother or a father from them. Right, that, and that's what you're doing to the family. Absolutely. So yes, by um, the end of the day, or if you want, start your Monday morning off this way. So digest all this crazy info over the weekend. Then Monday morning, visit CaliforniaFamily.org. Click on our Action Center. We'll provide you how to get connected with your assembly member. We'll provide talking points all on SB 729. So like Greg said, um, Greg, it's going to hit both the assembly and the Senate again, correct? That's correct. All right. So that, put that on your guys' to-do list for Monday. Um, call your assembly member. Call your state senator. Urge a no vote on SB 729. On that note, real quick, um, if you guys want to learn a little bit more about surrogacy, um, IVF, and the issues with it, on the other podcast um, we have at CFC, so be visit CaliforniaFamily.org. You can find podcasts. If you click on it, you'll see this one, Coffee Culture in the Capital. And you'll also see This is a Woman. And so I have had um, Callie Fell, and she is an MSBSNRN. So she is a nurse, and she talks all about the cost of surrogacy, the issues with it, and everything like that. So you can check that episode out, as well as we've had Katie Faust with them before us on it. And she is kind of known to be one of the leading fighters against the issues of IVF and surrogacy because she's fighting for pro-child um, values. So both of them have like an hour-long podcast with each diving into these topics, so you can check that out. But with that, Greg, we are going to now talk about something that we seem to find ourselves talking um, a lot about over the past year or two. Libraries and books. What is going on? What is AB 1825? Right. It's even, you know, being discussed in the presidential campaign, banning books. Like, how could you possibly want to ban a book? Right. But here's what's actually happening. Um, And we've seen this in our schools, uh, that there is uh, books that are sexually graphic being pushed for lower and lower grades, for for sinister reasons, I believe the there are people out there trying to get kids uh, feeling comfortable with very sexualized material at younger and younger age ages, and this is this is a grooming behavior. This is what uh, adults who want to have sexual relations with children have to do. And what they typically do is they start handing, uh, they want kids to be comfortable with sex, Mm. right? That it's, it's normal to get involved with sexual behavior at younger ages, right? You got to lower their kids, natural, uh, uh, humility and, uh, shyness about sexuality. And, the only way to do that is to give them more sexualized material. And so that's what we see happening at our schools. Uh, these books that they're introducing to kids um, uh, at younger and younger ages are full-blown, you know, descriptions about the sex act uh, in first, second, and third grade with pic- il- pictures and illustrations, right? <laughs> Nothing is left to the imagination. It's, it's, we've seen this over the years and, 
you know, we've been called prudes and book banners. It's like, come on. If you're a responsible parent, you limit what your children see. Good parents limit what their kids see. We know that sex and children do not go together. Sex is for adults, not for children. So what's been happening uh, at libraries is, is I'm not, well, we had three, I had three kids. And when we went to the library, we felt safe in sending the kids off to the children's section of the library to look for books, pick a book and bring it home, right? Well, just as an example, um, there's an article uh, in Cal Matters, which is a uh, online newspaper um, that covered uh, a controversy happening in Fresno. Um, you know, you have on during Pride Month, which is celebrated everywhere. Well, it's celebrated in this particular library in June, and they had in the children's section some books that were being featured in promo to all the kids coming into the library, and these books. Um, included a book called It's Perfectly Normal, which is a book about sex for uh, kids. Now, it says it's for, for about 10-year-olds, but um, it is pretty darn graphic. Um, we went ha around to the Capitol just recently um, and showed them pictures, uh, illustrations in the book, and they were just people having sex in all different types of positions. Um, including descriptions on the whole, uh, uh, <laughs> how each body part went inside and what happened and no detail was left unhidden. Does that, does your really, your little kid really need to know all those details? No, not unless you want him to start being curious about practicing what he sees. Little kids can't handle all that. It's too much. Everybody knows this. It, it, well, obviously not everybody knows this. So this particular bill we're talking about is AB uh, 1825 would, um, and this was happening in, in Fresno Library and a, a supervi county supervisor got a complaint. He said, you know what? We should not, we should be able to say these books should not be for in the children's section. He wanted to move them off to uh, a section where parents had to actually give approval for their kid to see them. Just so kids don't wander around and, and find some book and shock shock the kid and the parent, right? That seems pretty reasonable, but this bill would stop that. Um, the bill actually says this. It says libraries shall not um, limit access to library materials that may include sexual content, right? Now it's limit access. So it's not just, <laughs> oh, this book can't be in the library at all, no. It, it bans kids from having access to adult books. That is what the bill says. And so I, I think every parent is going to have to be very skeptical of and fearful that they can't trust the libraries anymore uh, to make sure the children's section has age-appropriate material, which should be decided by the local community. It should not be dictated by whoever's in San Francisco with San Francisco values about what kids, kids should learn about sex. It should be a local decision. So this bill eliminates locals having any control over uh, access to books uh, based on sexual content. Uh, we have a problem with that, and I think most parents would have a problem with that as well. Absolutely. So for everyone listening that does have a problem with that, what can they do, Greg, about AB 1825? Well, the book, is, the bill is now in the Senate, um, and it will be voted on just like the other one we talked about um, by the end of next week. So you got to call up your uh, assembly member and your senator and say you do not like AB 1825. Uh, libraries should be able to decide for themselves what is age-appropriate material for the children's sections of the library. Ironically, the bill... Uh, does not uh, limit, does not have any authority over school libraries. So the, you're, you're almost admitting, yeah, schools need to be able to limit what kids see, uh, curate, which, which they call it, uh, sexual content based on the age of the kid. Well, if you can do it for schools, why can't a local library do that? Don't they think kids, do they not think kids, 
go to libraries. <laughs> you know, well, the libraries are full of kids. And let's, don't we want our libraries full of kids? Well, this is going to act exactly against that. So, folks, you got to talk to your legislators um, if you want to. If you want to ever feel comfortable about going to a library again with your children. Absolutely. And so, if you're like it's overwhelming. I don't even know who my state senator is. I don't know who my assembly member is. How do I make those phone calls? Visit CaliforniaFamily.org and on our action center, we will tell you exactly who your state senator and assembly member are. And we literally, it's such a cool setup. You literally can make, if you do it on your phone, you can make the phone call from our website and it'll reconnect you to their office. We provide talking points to tell you what to say. And if you're like, I can't remember which bills to tell them to vote no and yes on, we have it all clearly on there. So visit CaliforniaFamily.org, check out our Action Center, and you can see what other um, bills, because there's a couple bills left that we're fighting against this year. But with that, Greg, is there anything else you would like to discuss? Yeah, I would just encourage you to go to our website. We have like half a dozen, eight, nine uh, different uh bills that are highlighted in our action center. And we have a new setup that you can do, uh, not just make phone calls, you can send emails to your legislator, you can actually tweet out a public tweet um, to your uh, legislator, so they see it publicly. There's all kinds of ways, easy way, we make it really easy for you to, takes a couple minutes um, to, speak up and you, you can't expect your legislators to be different or follow your values if you don't ever communicate with them. They're there representing you. So uh, your silence is more or less giving them permission to do whatever they want, Absolutely. right? Yep. So with that, we'll see you all next time. Um, by the time we see you all next time, hopefully you've already made some phone calls and spread the word on social media. Um, but we're not going to stop fighting until biblical values are protected again. So we'll see you all next time.